they are very happy to present the Inga Kamp from the Captain Institute at the Rex Universität Groningen in the Netherlands. Inga is a diploma uh, and PhD studies at the University of Kiel in northern Germany. And her PhD thesis was on CO in the circumstellar disks around Jan Astar. Then she uh, got actually a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship at the University of Leiden. And after a stint as assistant astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore of the US, she joined the University of Groningen, um, at which she is now a junk director of the Captain Institute. Welcome, Inga. We are very happy that you took the time to give the seminar, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wolf. Um, thanks also for the invitation to speak today. Um, of course, a, a lot of what I'm showing today is actually not my own work, but uh, a lot has been done by the postdocs and PhD students, but also bachelor students who, who worked with me during the course of the, the last 10 years, I would say. And also due to my collaborators, uh, Peter Wojtke and Wing Faiti, and a lot of the, the big projects that I have been member of. And so all of that, it allowed me to explore in much more detail how water and ISIS actually are distributed in these planet forming disks and what we can learn from the observations. So since this is an astrobiology seminar, I, I thought I would give a very, very general introduction. And one of the main points we try to do now is we want to join actually the astrophysics form with from the solar system our base view based on, on planets and objects that we see in the solar system of course the two have to come together so astrophysical observations allow us to actually look back into the past and see how a solar system how a planetary system emerges so we can observe it in a state where it's maybe a hundred thousand years old or one million years old and so what you see at the top here is actually how we think these planetary systems form. So we start out with a, a cloud which consists of gas and small dust particles. And there's already quite some chemistry going on. So we are already making molecules in that phase. We are making ices if, if that cloud is cold enough. And within that cloud, a region becomes gravitationally unstable and it will form a, a star plus a disk around it. And that's what we see here in the next stage, the protostellar envelope, the forming disk, the outflow. And all of that happens within certainly a million years. So the system is very, very young. And then we go into the next stage where, say, the outflows help also to disperse the material, any kind of remnant cloud material. And we end up with a kind of isolated planet forming disk around a young newborn star. And that's what we call in astrophysical terms a, a class two system. And then, of course, as time goes on, we will end up with a more mature planetary system, which has very, very little gas left to, to build more planets or to build atmospheres. And if we try to bring this picture of how astrophysically we observe the different phases in, in which stars and planets are forming with the picture we have from the solar system, we very much rely on the record we observe, for example, in meteorites. So when a, a meteorite is found, say, on Earth, we can cut it open and we see that it has certain components in there. For example, these little things that I show at the bottom here, little calcium aluminium inclusions, the CAIs, but also chondrules. All those are elements of, of a meteorite, so little small parts, and we can age date them because we know um, the, the isotope content. So we have radioactive uh, material in there that allows us to age date them. And so we see when we look at the solar system record that these calcium aluminium inclusions we find within the meteorites, within large rocky bodies, they actually are very, very old. So meaning they originate from a phase where the solar system was very young. So this uh, figure from Connelly at our 2012 actually puts the two things on one age scale. So we have both the 
evolution from the astrophysical point of view and how we age date back things in the solar system on the same scale. So we see these calcium aluminium inclusions probably originate in a phase where the system is still very much embedded from an astrophysical point of view where we may not even be able to really look into the disk and, and study what is happening there. And then the chondrules are actually a little bit younger so they they form over a much wider range of ages and that probably coincides with what we can readily observe with astrophysical um, observations, so the class two stage. But the, the point is that um, probably planet formation in the solar system or the, the building blocks of planets already formed quite early. And this is something that we can study now in systems around other stars as well. And so the idea is that we bring both of these together the details that we know from the solar system together with uh, the multitude of astrophysical objects that we can observe in order to come to a coherent idea about how planet formation works. So that is the main idea. And what I want to focus on in this presentation today is actually on this protoplanetary disk phase. So the phase where we think the first building blocks of planets have already formed and what we witness is actually act active planet formation. So in the past more than 10 years, I think we have gotten a quite good understanding, at least theoretical understanding for what we think these disks look like in terms of their, their chemistry. So they, they are of course molecular factories. I mean, we can make lots of molecules in these disks, but what kind of chemistry do we actually see? Well, this graph is uh, very exaggerated in the vertical scale because in principle, these disks are very, very flat like they are pancake structures, but in order to show everything, I, I just inflated them. And what you see is on the left, the star, and then we go out to larger and larger distances from the star. And I put the solar system or any planetary system on the bottom here for comparison. So we have the, the rocky planets in the inner part of the disk and the gas and ice giants further out. And in general terms, we understand now that there has been a radial temperature gradient in this disk going from being very hot for the material close to the star all the way to being extremely cold when we go out to beyond 10 astronomical units. And at a certain point, we actually drop in the temperature so much that we can form water ice, but at a certain point also CO2 ice, CO ice, so this is the ice regime here. And the ices are really only around the midplane. Why is that? Because the star with its radiation will actually shine on the surface of the disk and it will warm up the surface of the disk, but the radiation cannot penetrate deep into the disk because the disk is very opaque, at least to UV and optical radiation. And so inside the disk, we have this kind of extremely cold cocoon of material that is probably very icy. And on the outside, the disk will be actually ionized. And as we go substantially, subsequently deeper and deeper into the disk, we turn into the atomic and then into the molecular regime. And because we have radial and vertical temperature gradients, we see actually very interesting different regimes of chemistry. We have very rich iron molecule chemistry, for example, when we look at this kind of surface layer. But when we look at the inner disk, we also have extremely hot gas, and so that can be very CO rich, but yet have no molecular hydrogen because H2 can actually effectively react with oxygen to form OH. So there are very interesting chemistry regimes in these disks. In the intermediate regime, actually, we have a lot of neutral neutral chemistry, which usually requires activation energy in order to trigger it. But because the temperature in that intermediate part is of the order of a few hundred Kelvin, we can have that neutral neutral reaction chemistry. So when we want to understand how these disks look like in, in reality, um, we need to realize that we cannot just use like one facility to observe the disk simply because we have so different diverse conditions. We have extremely warm and very dense material in the inner part of the disk, and we have very dilute and extremely cold conditions in the outer part. So that means any gas that is distributed in the disk will radiate in a completely different wavelength range, depending on whether I look at the inner disk or the outer disk. So for example, 
in the outer desk, what we see is rotational lines of the carbon monoxide molecule, but also water. And you see a, a couple of them actually indicated in a spectrum here. So in the background, you see the, the flux that we receive from such a disk, if we observe it, say, from, from Earth, as a function of wavelengths. And so on the right-hand side, we have the radio wavelengths regime, the far infrared, and that's where we see a lot of rotational lines. And as we move more to the mid-infrared and to the near-infrared, we subsequently see the hotter and hotter gas coming from the inner disk. And so, in fact, we need to see the entire spectrum all the way from the optical to the submillimeter to piece together the emission of the disk coming from different radii. And so to get a, a full picture of the chemistry in the disk, but also the, the physical processes, we really need a very wide wavelength range of observations. Another example is uh, what is shown here as a green line, and I put the little inset um, to the top left of the slide here, which shows that there's this mid-infrared to far-infrared wavelengths regime that also shows you what the, the solid component of the disk is doing. We have a very rich mineralogy that potentially goes on in these disks because we, we know we have a lot of silicates in there. We probably also have carbonaceous dust. But you know what kind of silicates there are? There's a huge range out there, and we need to observe the solid state features of all these little dust grains in order to know what, what kind of silicates we have. So what you see in the little inset here is uh, the different emissivity, I should say, or opacity from the dust grains as a function of wavelengths. And we see that uh, a mineral like a phosphorite has a completely different imprint compared to something like, for example, the red one, serpentine, which is a, a phyllosilicate, or montmorillonite, which is in green. So these fingerprints of the different minerals are, are very different. And by observing actually over a wide wavelength range, we can piece together not only what is the dust composition as a function of distance from the star, but also what is the composition of the solid component. And this is very important for understanding what kind of planets are forming, what is the gas in the disk from which we can build, say, the atmospheres of terrestrial planets, but also what is the gas composition that we may find back in gas giant planets that are forming from these disks? And so there are various approaches in trying to bring together the astrophysical point of how these disks look like with the solar nebula. For example, in terms of uh, empirical models of the solar nebula, there are the two, I would say, older works of Lewis and also Cameron from 74 and 95 where they simply look at the temperature gradient that would be needed in a very early phase in the solar system to explain the difference in planet composition that we see, like going from Mercury to Venus and Earth and Mars, etc. So that leaves a kind of temperature gradient in the disk. And then we can also turn it around and we can take the astrophysical point of view and we can say, well, if we look at these, if we observe these disks in space, say with radio telescopes, um, we also observe what is the emissivity in the disk as a function of disk. That also gives you a temperature gradient. And so we can actually try to model the observations and understand how disks look like when they are, for example, about a million years old. And then we can try to bring this together and yeah, try to learn about how, how planets have formed in the solar system, but also how they form elsewhere. So we have now a, a very fortunate situation because especially with the coming of, of ALMA, which is these uh, 66 uh, radio antennas in Chile, we have an enormous spatial resolution for our observations so we can resolve these disks on a scale of a few astronomical units. And we can really see how the material is distributed in these disks. We also have the ground-based very large telescopes that allow us in the near infrared to probe a, a population of small dust grains that are in the surface of these disks. So with the uh, ALMA, with the submillimeter view, we see the, the millimeter dust grains that are mostly confined to the disk midplane. And with the near infrared scattered light of small dust grains, we see actually what happens to micron sized dust grains in the disk surface. And having both at the same time with enough spatial resolution, it allows us to really learn about the disk structure and 
hopefully relate that to planet formation. And what you see here is a, a compilation from the paper of Sean Andrews that shows for a whole sample of disks observed both with ALMA but also the VLT and scattered light, how the material is distributed. And, and this is the solid material, just to be clear, this, this is a dust. And you see that we see a bit of everything. We have rings and gaps, we see arcs, we see spiral structure. And the question you can ask yourself is, you know, is it all planets? Is every single structure we see a planet? And unfortunately, we, we cannot be sure. I mean, there are other processes, like for example, we are losing mass from the disk through winds, whether it's driven by magnetic fields or driven by photo evaporation. We also have gravitational or hydrodynamical instabilities that can lead to spirals. We can have companions, so the star is not alone, but maybe there's a, a companion star further away, and actually that triggers spirals in the disk as well. And so in some cases, um, it may be planets, like giant planets can, for example, carve a, a cavity in the inner disk. They can also cause vortices, so they can capture dust in structures that we see, for example, down here, that we have simply an overdensity of dust on, on one side. And so I think maybe not all of these structures are really due to planets, but in, in some cases, I, I think we can be pretty that this structure is caused by planets. And so that is the exciting part that we think nowadays that a lot of what we see is at least related to the process of planet formation. So planet formation seems to be well on its way at the time that we observe these disks. And with that general introduction, I would like to give you more of an idea of what we did in the past years to understand a bit better how is the water distributed in these planet forming disks but also how does it relate to what we see, for example, in asteroids, in the solar system, and also in, in comets. So we have done this using a lot of observations, but also a lot of modeling of the chemistry and the radiative transfer in disks. So let me first uh, talk a little bit about water in these planet forming disks. I think from a, a lot of simulation work, but also observations, we have come to an understanding for how water is distributed in these disks. And what I show here is actually the vertical coordinate on the y-axis versus the distance from the star in logarithmic units. So the star is uh, here at the, at the origin. And in color, what you see is the abundance of water in the disk. So if you see 10 to minus four, it means that all oxygen that we have in the gas actually formed water because usually the ratio between oxygen and hydrogen is about 10 to minus 4. And so that tells you immediately that in this inner part of the disk, so within one astronomical unit, we have a lot of gas phase water vapor sitting here. And go further out, there happens what I explained before. I mean, we go down in temperature and we reach a certain limit beyond which actually the water will freeze on the surfaces of the solid dust grains in the disk. And that is where we have ice. And that is why in this figure that shows the water vapor abundance, actually this area here remains pitch black dark because that's where the water ice is. But what kind of chemistry do we actually find in these different parts of the disk? So in that inner part where we have very high temperatures and densities, very likely, the water formation is in, in thermodynamic equilibrium. So we, we get a lot of water, all oxygen goes into water, but all the carbon, which is then left, if we have a carbon to oxygen ratio, which is larger than one, then the carbon will actually go on to form methane, simply because that's the most thermodynamically stable molecule it can be in. But as we go further away from that inner very dense region, we come into a regime in the disk where very likely chemistry is not in thermodynamic equilibrium anymore. And so we do have to solve a kinetic rate network in order to find out which of the chemical species are actually dominating. And so when we are at warm temperatures, which is uh, the second part here, so when we are in this regime, the oxygen is locked still a lot in gas phase water, but also in CO. And there's a, a little bit of CO2 as well. So we have a kind of CO2 ring forming here as well. And if we go 
further out, as I said, um, we go to temperatures between 150 and 20 K, and there oxygen is actually locked in water ice predominantly. Now, when you look at the surface, you see that there is actually a water reservoir, not extremely high abundances, but still significant abundances of water up here. And that is um, a very warm regime. So the water here forms through neutral neutral reactions. And then you have a, another interesting reservoir that kind of you know, bends around the, the ice reservoir, the snow line. And this is at lower densities, but it, it's a lot of water that comes back into the gas phase because it's photodesorbing from the ices. And if we go even further out, this is where we have then CO ice. So oxygen is predominantly locked in CO ice. So we, we see that we have these different water reservoirs in the disk. And this is predicted from a computer simulation. And one, one of the things I, I want to make clear is if you look at the ice line here, I know a lot of pic a lot of people when they picture the solar system, they have kind of a, an ice line sitting at one or a few astronomical units and they picture it as a kind of vertical line. But what it actually is, the snow line actually bends around and, and also comes back to the midplane because at a certain distance from the sun, it is not the thermal evaporation of ice that limits the, the snow line, but it is the photodesorption. So even though it's very, very cold in the outer disk, photons coming from the interstellar medium can reach the icy grains there, and they will simply break a bond and they will liberate the water ice from the surface of these grains. And so what we think is that we have actually an outer gas phase reservoir here, even though it's very cold, it is the photons that actually prevent the, the ice, the gas from freezing out entirely on the ices. So did we actually detect these different reservoirs? And yes, we did. So for example, we can take near infrared spectra and you see here up on, on the left, a spectrum taken around three micron um, from the ground. And that is one of, the disks, it's DR tau, but I don't care which disk particularly. The interesting point is that you see here in the solid, the solid black line is actually the data, the spectrum taken of this particular disk. And the, the black dashed line, which is underneath here, under the, the red line, this is a model simulation of how the imprint of water would look like if we put it into the disk around DR tau. So the hot water, which is probably a few thousand Kelvin in, in temperature, that is leaving its imprint in the near infrared spectrum. And it is actually what we observe. So all these little lines that we see here are actually in the data. So that means that there is a lot of hot water vapor in the system DR tau. We have also seen the a little bit cooler component like 600, 500 Kelvin roughly in temperature with the Spitzer space satellite. So also that has been seen. And then we have the cold water here. So on the right hand side, you see a, just a, a sketch of, of the disk. Um, the interesting thing is that we had a, a satellite in space, the Herschel Space Observatory, and it observed at very long wavelengths, so it could access actually the ground state rotational lines of the water molecule. And the interesting aspect about one of the instruments we had on board, this was a hi-fi instrument, which has been built uh, partly also here in Groningen at Eshorn, is that it had a lot of spectral resolution. So we could actually use Doppler effect. So this disk is rotating around the young star, and we could actually see that one side was rotating away from us and the other side is coming towards us. So this Doppler effect actually led to the waterline being split into two peaks. And this is what we observed in one particular system in, again, in the Tau star forming region in, in DG Tau. And so we clearly saw that there was this kind of cold water reservoir because the water is typically of the order of 50 Kelvin when it's uh, emitting in this particular line and it was rotating around the star. So that was pretty cool. But apart from actually detecting the water, the interesting point is that the water 
lines can actually tell us also about the physics going on in this disk because we can compare these observations with the simulations that we did before and we can check whether we see all the water that we predict or not and then we can speculate you know why why we see less or you know whether we see it in the right position as well as a function of radius and so this led to people actually proposing that first of all what we see is clearly photodesorption from icy grains it is something that I think by now we have proved also observationally. And we can speculate whether in some cases a depletion of water compared to what we expect may be due to the fact that the icy dust grains that can form in the outer disk actually predominantly settle down to the mid plane. So there's a vertical component of gravity from the star pulling them down. And that would mean that the atmosphere of the disk, the higher layers, actually get depleted in water and maybe in some cases we can even speculate whether the icy grains sitting in the outer disk migrate inwards because of gas dust interaction so that leads to a spiraling in of these dust grains together with the ices and maybe that can also deplete the outer disk in gas phase water so this is the interesting prospect that we have that we can use water both to actually tell us, to inform us how much water there is as a reservoir to build planets and planetary atmospheres, but also indirectly use it to actually understand some of the physics going on in the disk, like, for example, the settling and the radial migration of dust grains. And we took this to um, another level. So we included in our simulations in the, in the modeling part a full exploration of the parameter space. We wanted to, to really understand what we can learn when we observe these water lines. And so one of the things we noticed is with early observations of the Spitzer spacecraft, we actually we, we saw water at a certain level of emission, but in some cases we didn't see anything at all. And then the question is, is there no water or are we simply not able to see it in our observations? And so we actually managed to show with the uh, simulations, with the computer simulations, that depending on where we put our water vapor with respect to where all the dust grains are, it actually makes a difference for how strong the water emission becomes. So this is basically telling you that it matters how deep we can look into a disk. Because the, you know, the first layer, like I told you, is atomic or ionic. And as we go deeper into the disk, we become molecular. But now, how deep can we actually look into the disk? Can we actually see that water reservoir or not? And what we show is that the more dusty an inner disk is, the more opaque it is to radiation, and the less of the water we will be able to see. And a PhD student of mine actually coupled a code that actually follows the evolution of dust as a function of time as it's settling down and radially migrating inwards and what he showed is that as the dust is being processed through radial migration and settling down the water lines become brighter and brighter so what you see here is the the line flux in the water lines and water here is actually the the blue um, diamonds here so the water lines as a function of time. So we ran the simulations for about 10 million years. And very early on, the water lines are extremely weak at this level. But then as the dust is evolving, more and more of the water becomes visible to us simply because the dust continuum goes down in the disk. And the gray box up here shows the observed level of water emission. So we see at an age of a few million years, this is the typical level of emission that we observe, but this is then also the typical level of emission that we see in our simulations. So I, I think the, the water is actually also an indicator of how much dust evolution and growth has happened in these systems. Now, to come to the next point, um, how do we actually link this to the solar system? We can look at how we can use water to actually incorporate water into the solid form even though we are not talking about water ice now there's one way of getting water into your solids and into planet formation and that is if you have icy bodies 
then you simply build from the icy bodies large cores and you know you get the water in there through the ice but we were interested in seeing actually whether we can process a lot of the minerals a lot of the silicates and use the warm water vapor that we know is present in these discs and actually turn some of the silicates into hydrosilicates into phyllosilicates and so a, a phd student of us actually did a, a monte carlo simulation we took a you know the the energy um, sites on a phosphorite surface and then we we let water molecules actually land on it and we followed how much water can actually bind to these warm surfaces So the, the bottom line is that we, we show that we can actually make these hydrous minerals very close to the star in the disk. And we put this into a, a kinetic model of the disk um, to simulate how much of these hydrous minerals we can actually form and where we can form them in the disk. And we see that in this area here, so within one astronomical unit, we can actually make a substantial amount of hydrous minerals and, and that will help us. So if we are forming terrestrial planets very close to the star, it actually helps us to get a significant amount of water, namely a few percent, into these refractory grains. And that will help us to, to get water, for example, into the core and mantle of these planets. So the, the last point I would like to touch upon is the, the icy reservoir. So we use comets as a kind of reservoir. We think it's a very pristine reservoir for what the building blocks of planets may have looked like. And we can look at the, the composition of them in terms of, you know, ratio of different ices in comets, but also the D over H ratio to inform us, you know, about, say, how the Earth oceans, for example, came about, whether that water got delivered by comets or not. But we were very interested in seeing whether with our disk simulations, with the chemical models that we have, whether we get anywhere close in the, the ballpark of what is observed in comets. And that was within an, an ISI workshop we had in 2018-19. And you see here in the red points are actually observations of methane over water in different comets from Erica Gibb. And then you see the different models from which we actually, from the literature and, and from people who joined the team, where we extracted the composition at different distances from the star, but also as a function of time, or some models actually had a, a component that material got mixed in the disk and some were without mixing. And we just wanted to have an idea of how we are actually doing in terms of composition. And you see that, you know, within the models, we can find you know, certain situations that reproduce the abundances that we, we see in comets. But in, in principle, there are so many different processes in these disks potentially going on that it becomes very difficult to say, you know, this and this and this is the way how we make the comets. And so I, I think this is a very interesting research that I think needs to be continued to bring together the, the astrophysical knowledge that we have about how the formation of, of ISIS is working actually before the disk is even formed, but also in the disk stage, and actually compare that with what we see in the comets. And the, the interesting aspect is that we can observe these ISIS in disks as well. So we see ISIS in absorption or in scattered light, but also in emission. So in emission, we of course see the thermal emission of the ISIS. And again, what you see here on the lower left is a, a disk model where on the y-axis we have the height in the disk, on the x-axis is the distance from the star. And what you see in the white dashed line again is the ice reservoir. This is the snow line in the disk. And the issue is now that when we look in scattered light, of course, we will only see ices if they are really in the disk surface. And very often what we see is that the ice reservoir is sitting so deep in the disk that the only prospect we have to observe the ices is to look for the thermal emission from these icy grains, which happens at far infrared wavelengths at 40 or 60 micron. And this is the spectrum you see here. So it's a, the flux as a function of wavelengths. And this is the 40 micron 
ice feature and this broad one here is a 60 micron ice feature. And what we did is in the simulations, we used ice opacities from different types of ices. So either we form them cold and we warm them up, or we form them gradually as the temperature goes down. And within the spectrum, we can actually distinguish these different scenarios because the ices that actually are gradually warmed up, that is the, the red spectrum here, produces very weak ice features, while the ones that are cooled down, they come from a, a ice formation that happens at high temperatures, so we form very crystalline ice that leaves a, a very pronounced peaky feature here at 40 micron. So we can distinguish from the observations directly about what kind of history those ices have have been through while they they were sitting in the disk. And what we were very much looking forward to is a, a lot of observations. We need really statistical samples of disks in order to discriminate different scenarios. But unfortunately, the, the far infrared space mission that we had a mind speaker in the end uh, got cancelled. And so we will not be getting that data, unfortunately. But I still think that this is a, a very interesting route to learn about the, the history of ISIS and disks to actually have access to these far infrared observations. So with that, let me just close and and summarize. Um, I think, I hope what I showed you in this talk is that the, the gap between protoplanetary disk research, planet formation, and also the solar system is now finally closing. And within these disks, we have observed a very rich inner water reservoir. And we see that uh, we potentially have a low water abundance in the outer disk, but we may be able to explain that with different physical processes going on. And so the question that we still have open is whether water is present everywhere in the disk. If we don't see water, is it simply an issue of sensitivity? Or does it tell us really that these disks are very dry? We don't know yet. And the water lines probe indirectly the ice reservoir of the disk and the surface location of the snow line because the water vapor reservoir kind of wraps around the ice reservoir. And if we can actually quantify this from observations, we will know how much solid mass is available for planet formation, so how much solid water is available to build oceans and also water worlds. And we have seen in very few cases that some disks contain water ice, but we still need to make a, a link between what we observe and to the history of that ice. So how much of that water ice that we see actually predates even the formation of the disk, because if the disk is built from material that comes from the molecular cloud, maybe the, the ice features that we see, the shape of the features, will actually tell us whether the ice that we observe is inherited already from a molecular cloud phase, or whether this ice is actually made in the disk itself. And so the, the thing we are, of course, very much looking forward to is uh, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope because with that, we will have a, a tremendous access to the warm chemistry that is going on in the inner part of the disk, in the part where terrestrial planets are forming. And what I show here on the lower right is the kind of spectra that we expect to observe in the mid-infrared. And those spectra show you different molecules in the different colors, for example. Um, we have HCN, we have CO2 here in the, in the uh, what is it, magenta colors. And we will be able to use these James Webb spectra to actually learn something about the, the inner chemical factory in these disks and, and how it relates to planet formation. So with that, I, I will close. Thanks, and um, sorry for the technical problems. There is Eva, please go ahead. Oh, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, that's that's a very interesting talk indeed. Thank you so much. And uh, I mean, th there is this uh, um, a possibility which people does uh, uh, consider, and you mentioned this as well, about uh, uh, sort of forming uh, our Earth uh, with the all content of the uh, of the water which is needed um, for what we observe now. Uh, um, is is that uh, is, is 
fair, firm um, conclusion or it's going too far? I, I'm not sure I understand the question fully. So are you asking whether we can have enough water to the processing of silicates in order to explain how much water there is in Earth? Yes. In, in principle, I think mass budget-wise, yes, we, we can have enough water in these small dust grains. The question is whether it survives the planet formation process. So if we just take the small grains we have, say at a time then we, when we observe these disks, say a million years old, these grains potentially have enough water to account for all the water we, we find in the Earth mantle and in the Earth ocean. But of course, we have to bring these small dust grains together to form the Earth, and that can be a pretty violent process. So it can also involve a, a certain level of degassing, and, and that hasn't been quantified. So how much water do we actually lose in the process of, of building a planet? If it's a very gentle process, then maybe we can preserve a lot of that water, but we don't know yet. Okay, so to start with, it's enough, but and then it yeah. depends on the history, right? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Actually, a question of Bill Irwin on the chat. Do your model suggest that maybe this is related to what um, what yeah. uh, Eva said? So I think this is probably somewhat already answered if Bill has not really something else to want to know. Uh, there is another question by Emmanuel Jacquet. What grain size is assumed for two to three weight percent water at one EU? Yeah, so what, what we assume in our models is a, a typical grain size distribution that we observe in these planet forming disks. So it usually goes from very small grains so 0 0.05 micron all the way to millimeter, one millimeter, three millimeter size grains. But it is what I would call dust. So everything that we can observe. I mean, we, we don't know if there are larger solid particles in the disk because we, we cannot infer this directly from observation. So what our models treat as solids is the grains that we are able to observe. And so that is the grain size distribution. Okay. Any further more questions? Um, I've shared the YouTube channel on the chat. Thank you very much for your participation. And see you in the next seminar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.